should have like some music. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Carrie, and I'm part of the programming team at the Westport Library. And we are honored and excited tonight to be hosting this event, Resilience and Recovery, Rediscovering Life After a Brain Tumor, during May, which is Brain Tumor Awareness Month. Um, tonight, we are welcoming Natalie Jacob, who will be talking about her 2018 memoir, Eight, rediscovering life after a brain tumor. And then we're gonna move into a panel discussion. Um, and so to introduce our panelists tonight, I would like to turn it over to Chris Cusano, who is a brain tumor survivor and also the executive director of the Brain Tumor Alliance, uh, Connecticut Brain Tumor Alliance. So I'd like to welcome Chris. Hello, Chris. Hello, thank you very much, Carrie. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. It's a distinct honor and privilege to be alongside this fabulous gr group of panelists. Um, Natalie uh, Jacob, author of Brain Tumor Survivor, Dr. Malaterno, Chief of Neurosurgery at uh, Yale Lehman Hospital, and Jennifer Pace, Brain Tumor Survivor and one of the co-founding members of the Connecticut Brain Tumor Alliance. Thank you all. I look forward to a wonderful discussion with everybody and uh, a great conversation. Natalie, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Um, okay, wait. Um, how do I put the presentation up again? Oh, there it is. Okay. Hi, everybody. So first of all, um, it's really an honor to be here and, um, and to be able to share my story with you guys. Um, it's, it's been by now five years um, since I had my surgery. And it's, it's been, a, it's been a, a, an enriching um, experience for me um, and my family. And, um, and I think that, that just by, by sharing my story with you guys, um, it's a way to create brain tumor awareness and May is the month of brain tumors. So, um, so it's a great opportunity to, to create brain tumor awareness for not only for the patients, but also for, for all the family members um, of people that have, um, have had or have brain tumors at the moment. Um, so I wanted to start by asking you all a question. How would you feel if suddenly you can't read or write or add two plus two? This is how I started the journey to reinventing myself. Um, but before I go to this um, long journey, I wanted to share a little bit about myself um, with you guys um, before my brain tumor. Um, so I was, as you can tell by my accent, I, am, I, I wasn't born in the USA. I was born in Bogota, Colombia. Um, but I was born to a very international family. So my mom is American and my father is um, French. And um, so my household was always very, very international. Um, we spoke three languages, English, Spanish, and French um, constantly. Um, we ate international food. Um, and because I was, I was brought up in such an international way, I wanted to continue living my life um, and focusing it um, in a way that I could create an opportunity for myself to continue having a very um, international lifestyle. Um, so I, I started um, quite young, so I left at 15 years old to go and live to Paris and learn French over there. Um, so I, I finished my, I, I did my high school in France. Um, and then I, I studied also college in, in, in the Netherlands. I did my MBA in Madrid um, and, I, and I continued my work career um, in different countries, like in Spain, Puerto Rico, well, not Puerto Rico as a country, but as in, as in a state, um, in Miami, and now I'm living in Westport in Connecticut. Um, I, so I did my MBA at IE Business School and I studied business. Um, so I've always been a very business-oriented person. Um, and I discovered when I was actually living in, in the Netherlands that my passion was marketing. So I focused all my career um, in working for the best um, companies you can work for in terms of marketing, which is um, the FMCG world, which is companies like, um, and these are some of the companies that I work for, Frito-Lay, Nokia, L'Oreal, um, Johnson & Johnson, and D'Angelo, as an example. 
Um, and I just wanted to share this with you, with all of you, because that is what made me um, who I was. That was my passion. I was a workaholic. Um, that's what I, that's why I just, that's the reason why I would wake up every single day. I would just love to work. Um, and um, so I just wanted to share this picture with you guys because it's, it, it's not only in my adult life, but as a child, I was already um, a little bit of a nerd. Um, so I loved studying. Um, so I just wanted to share this, this pictures with you guys of the passions that I had before that made me who I was. Um, so um, I fell in love. Um, and so in terms of the people and the family that I has also been my passion, I added on my husband, which is um, um, also the father of my child. And another passion that I've always had, me and my family has actually been saving. Um, so this was what made Natalie Jacob happy in the past. Um, and then one day um, I go skiing and I, to Canada and was there with some work colleagues actually. Um, and it hadn't snowed in, in quite some time. It had been already like two weeks with no snow. And I was, it was my first day. I was, you know, full of energy. My muscles didn't hurt. Um, and I was going down the slope super quick, a little bit kamikaze, like I like to ski with no helmet, uh, which was a good thing. And you'll see why in a second. Um, and I felt, I felt really, really hard. Um, I tumbled down the mountain and um, it was so hard that I, like, I broke my goggles actually, which protected me from the fall. Um, and I stayed low for some minutes because I, I couldn't stand up of the pain. And I had my, my finger um, really, really red, um, not red, sorry, black, um, bruised. So, but I didn't want to, you know, ruin my ski trip. It was the first day out of five. So I just, you know, went down the field, um, down, the, down the hill, um, bought a popsicle, took out the stick and bought some tape and I wrapped it out and continued my, my trip and continued enjoying my vacations. And I went back to Miami. That's where I was living back at the time. Um, and, and I did go to a doctor just to check, you know, cause I did fall and I, and I wanted to check my finger. Um, so I told them the story and they said, well, look, let's just check just in case to do a CT scan um, to make sure that nothing bad happened. So I, so we did that. And the doctor comes out and says, well, there is something um, that's there. Nothing that happened with the fall, but there is something that you do need to check. Um, oops, wait, sorry. Carrie's telling me she can't see the screen. Um, give me one second. Oh. Share. Is it up now, Kay? Thumbs up? Okay. Did you see any of the other slides? Thumbs down? Okay. <laughs> okay, so wait, I'm not gonna go too much behind, but just to give you an idea of what I was talking about. Give me one sec. I'm not gonna repeat what I said, but it's just too. Okay, here we go. Okay. So basically, this was the site where I was just sharing a little bit about my story before, um, the places I've lived and where I study, um, and the places that I used to work before. Um, and I actually, the last year I, I worked with, uh, was um, five years ago, um, which is when I discovered my brain tumor. Um, and these were the pictures that I was sharing about a little bit about my passion, so my husband, um, my sailing, and um, when, I, when I used to work and do a lot of actually presentations in the past. Um, which you generally do in this type of multinationals. Um, okay, so back to the slide. So, so I found out this, so, okay, so I, sorry, I'm trying to remember, and I have a short-term memory, so that's part of it um, as well. Um, so I, so the doctor came out and he said, um, nothing happened with the fall, but you do have something there that you do have to check with a neurosurgeon. Um, not here because it was the emergency room. So I took an appointment. Um, so the following week, um, as soon as I could, I went and I saw the doctor um, and I went with my husband and um, we go in and he basically tells us um, that I had an intraventricular meningioma. And it was a super simple procedure. He said that it was actually growing quite quick and he recommended to have surgery as soon as possible. 
Um, and he literally opened his agenda. And he said, oh, I have a spot in two weeks time. So if you just want to, if you're free, I really recommend you do this. Um, so, you know, so, and he was really calm. And he said, there's only, so we obviously asked if there was any risks. And he said, the only risk was a 2% chance of losing my peripheral eyesight, um, which is basically what we see to the sides. Um, and that was it. And a recovery of only three weeks time. And it was a very simple procedure, um, a surgery that, could, that would only take two hours. So we were very, we were not actually like scared at all because the, uh, the neurosurgeon explained it in such a confident way. It sounded easier than taking a tooth out. So my husband and I weren't worried at all um, to the point that we didn't even Google what we had. And he never really said the words brain tumor at the beginning. He just said intraventricular meningioma, which didn't really mean anything to us. So we, we honestly weren't that scared. Um, and I just, we go home and I literally have two weeks to hand in over my, my, my job. So my, my whole focus, these two weeks, are that. I don't, I don't even really think much about any surgery or anything at all. I'm just having fun with my parents that came over to visit me. And I was focusing on just handing over my job. And then the, de the day comes, and it was a Sunday, I remember that, um, to go and, and, and stay that night in the hospital before the surgery, which was going to happen the next day. And even then we were still, we, we went in with my, my family and my husband. And even then we were still joking around. Obviously it was a bit a strange feeling now because I was in the hospital. Um, but even then we were still joking. So they put, before you have a, a brain surgery, they put you this little thing. And my husband's like, ooh, wait a second, wait a second. And he's Googling his phone. And he's like, boom, look at what you look at. And I, it was so funny. I mean, it was, we were just having fun, honestly. And so I go into surgery. And two hours later, I come out and I cannot read and I cannot add and I cannot, I don't know what two plus two means. And I find this hilarious. So I come out of my surgery and I still know how to speak my three languages and understand them, English, French, and Spanish, yet I can't read. So they give me a paper and a pen and they ask me to write my name and I draw a circle, yet I know that my name is Natalie Jacob, and I, and I draw a circle, and I can't stop laughing. Um, and they make me walk the corridors of the hospital, um, and they ask me, um, so what is the number on that room? And so I read it, and I'm like, eight. So they, they take me to the next door, and they're like, what number is that one? I'm like, eight. Um, and then they asked me, so from one to 10, where's your pain threshold? Well, of course it's eight. <laughs> um, and they asked me what year I was born and at 1800. Um, and so that's the reason why the book is called Eight. Um, and I will never know why my brain saw it, that it was an eight, um, but that was my reality. That's what my eyes were seeing and slash my brain, that's what I was seeing. Um, so I found this, fascinating. And I found this so funny. Obviously, my family on another side, they were not um, having a blast. They were obviously extremely shocked. Um, they did not expect this at all. Um, and the problem and what happened to me is that I suffered of something called Gertzman syndrome, um, which is very, very highly unlike, unlikely to happen to someone, yet I won the lottery. Um, and I had that as a side effect. And that was what the, one of the reasons. Um, and remember the, the, the peripheral eyesight risk of losing it, which was only a 2% chance. Um, I did wake up and I had lost it. Um, but I didn't know it was going to be permanent. I just thought it was going to be temporary. And the doctor said it could be temporary and it could come back in two months. So I was not worried, honestly, at all. Um, and I wanted to share this little video with you guys. It's in Spanish, but it's just to, for you guys to see like how I was writing. This was in the hospital. So she just said, um, write the vowels, um, a, you know, a, a, e, oh gosh, a, a, e, o, u, the four, the, the five vowels. Um, and what I just wrote was a one or sort of a one, more like a scribble. 
Um, so that's, that's, that's how I, that's, that was Natalie for, for months. And so I go back home um, and I, a lot of people would think it was a very difficult moment in, in my life, but actually it was spectacular. It was beautiful. I, my brain was so simple. Um, it was how I call it. It was just so dumb, um, so, so basic that life was beautiful. I would go and walk, for example, with someone because I would, somebody who would have to take me to walk because I didn't know how to manage my eyesight yet. So I would fall down the stairs. I couldn't use a knife because I would cut myself. Um, so I would be walking down the street and I would hear a little bird chirp and I'd be like, oh my God, birdie, birdie. And I would, there we, you know, a 34 year old enjoying a little bird or my, my friends would come and visit me and, um, and they would like, you know, come into the living room and I would be in a corner. I would, I would just wave, hi. And I would just go back and I would color. I would color like a toddler for hours. And that was the only thing that made me happy. And my brain was so simple. I couldn't even watch TV because TV was too complicated to understand. So when in the past, before the surgery, I thought I was going to, you know, catch up on all those series. I never had time to. I couldn't even understand TV. It was too complex for my brain to understand. So it was beautiful to see life like a toddler does. And I, and I think it was a gift in a way at that moment. But little by little, I started to do of course, a lot of therapy because I did not want to be like this for the rest of my life. And I knew that I couldn't read or write, but I was not going to let that be the truth for the rest of my life. So unfortunately, my health insurance would only cover one hour per week of therapy, which I thought was not enough. So I, I got the books that the therapist, and when I mean therapist, I mean speech therapist, which, is, which are, is, are the medical people that basically help you to learn how to read and write again. Um, so the speech therapist gave me the books and I took it as a full time job and I would wake up at 8 a.m. every morning and I would go to the gym one hour and then I would go back and I would just do therapy and read and write and add and things like, for example, drawing a clock, just, just a clock and putting the time like 3 p.m. was so difficult to do and it took me months to be able to learn how to do that. Um, but I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna not try. I knew I, I knew I could go back to normal and I did not stop trying. Um, and this was months and months became, became years. Um, and it wasn't easy after, uh, after some time, you know, life isn't all roses. And that's where it, it really started to become hard. So after three months, um, my boss actually would come and visit me and he was, he was honestly a, a great man. Um, but they would come and visit and they could see that I clearly could not read or write. So obviously, so they let me go. So I lost my job. And with that meant that we lost 60% of, of, of our family, um, household income. Um, so that was very difficult. Um, we also had to sell my house, um, the house we had in Miami. Um, and my, my, my eyesight never came back. So unfortunately, what was very difficult for me was that um, I, just to explain everybody like in the audience, how it feels, like if I, if I look at my computer, I only see half of the screen. Um, if I look at a TV, I only see half of the screen. So I don't see anything from here to, to this side, like nothing at all. Okay. So I just see half. Um, but the most difficult part of this, I'm going to say it's three things. It's one, my brain fatigue, and it's, it's an invisible disability that nobody can see. People see me and they think I'm normal and you can see me here full of energy, but as soon as I hang up, I am dead. Um, my brain in order just to work and function uses so much more energy because it's just been affected that I, I it could be a, a, a normal day at 10 a.m. And, and I have brain fatigue or it could be at 12 p.m. It could be anything. It just kicks in really, really hard. And it's, it's really, really tough. Um, and the hardest thing for me was the loss of my IQ. And by coincidence, I had an exam done um, six months before my surgery. 
So I know what IQ I had before. And I had several exams done after um, my IQ, eh, sorry, my surgery, um, but paid by the medical insurance um, done by neuropsychologists. And I literally passed from, ha from being above average to below, below average. And that was really, really difficult because that means I just, you know, lost who I was. Um, but when I was doing my therapy, which meant basically learning how to read and write um, and doing sh and, and improving my short-term memory, um, which was really, you know, chaotic, um, I would just write in my computer. And by writing in my computer, I would be forced to read. So I never planned to write a book at all. I was just writing about my experience just for therapy purposes. Um, and then I... Then I, I found out that I was pregnant. And then when that news came, it was obviously spectacular news. And then I realized that my daughter won't know the Natalie that, I, that used to be before. Because, you know, I don't even, like at that time, I don't even know who I'm going to be. Because I, I, the person that had a definition is no longer there. Um, so I decided to publish the book, to write a book and publish it for her, for my daughter. Um, and, and it's been, and since I've published it, I've received so many, um, you know, thank you notes saying that it's, it's actually helped them and it's inspired them. Um, and that's the reason why I've decided to also share my story, you know, like this, like in this, um, setting with you guys. And I've done some, some book, um, speeches around in, in, you know, in libraries, etc. Um, just because I've, been told that I can help someone. And if I can help someone, and if I can inspire someone through my story, um, I am really happy to share it, even though after this call, I am going to be brain fatigued completely and exhausted, but um, hoping my, my story can help others. Um, but it wasn't easy. And it, it was really sad. It was a really sad period of my life um, when I discovered that I had lost my IQ. And I discovered that I had no purpose in life because my only purpose in life was to work. That was my thing. So how do you find a new purpose in life? Um, so I, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I had um, still free time now, I do not, but at that time I had. And so I started to volunteer. And so the first, um, the first, um, the, the first um, nonprofit that I started to volunteer was actually the Connecticut Brain Tumor Alliance. And that's how I discovered that that was my passion, to help others. So I started through that. Then I continued volunteering for the Connecticut, for the Connecticut um, Legally Blind Association. And um, finally, also for um, a, a school in Bridgeport for students in need. And very little, few hours, because I don't have that much energy, unfortunately, due to my brain fatigue. But but that's how I discovered that my passion was actually helping others. So I found a new purpose in life. And I, and obviously knowing that I don't have um, a lot of energy and I have to minimize what I do, I created three little Facebook groups um, like where I live. So the first one is a, a, a brain tumor um, group for survivors and for family members in Spanish across Latin America and in Spain because there was, there was, one, there was none. In the USA, there's a ton, but there was none in Latin America and, and in Spain. Um, and then I also created a Facebook group to help women that start businesses from their own homes um, in Westport, which is the town where I live in. And I also created a group for um, moms because, you know, motherhood is spectacular, but it's also very tough. Um, so it's a group, it's a safe group for just moms to get and meet together and to toddlers and babies to, you know, make friends of the same age. And it's been pretty spectacular. And, and, and you know, it's just a little way to help um, moms, brain tumor survivors, and business um, women that are in the world. And I've honestly been um, positively surprised with, with the, you know, the, the accept, like, with how, many, how well my book has been accepted. I had never expected it. And, I, and, um, and so these are just some pictures of, um, you know, I've been, I've been in the news several times. I've been honored. Um, to, to be able to share my story um, with more people. And it's just, I never expected it, honestly. So it's just, it's, it's, it's a nice surprise. And then finally, I just wanted to um, close with, um, with just a, um, a, a part of uh, a phrase of my book, um, 
So I'm going to read it. I'm sorry. I read really bad. So sorry if I read slow, but I'm going to just give it a try. Okay. So reinventing yourself. Having the mental flexibility to reinvent yourself, your goals, and what brings you joy and meaning in life will be the strength you need to continue building your life path without breaking you when things get, get in your way. Don't just hope for a better moment. Create it, work for it, and make it happen. Life doesn't happen to you. You make it happen. And, um, and that is my story. And I, I, I probably forgot a lot of things, um, but that's due to my short-term memory. But that is my story. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Natalie, and thank you for sharing your story and your bravery in, in doing so. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, and I encourage everybody to read the book because it truly is fascinating. It's a great read. It's, um, you know, a captivating story, and you'll, you'll go on experience with her. Um, so it's wonderful, and, and thank you again for sharing. Um, so for everybody that, that perhaps doesn't know, um, you know, about brain tumors and what it's like, um, you know, Jen uh, Pace, Natalie and myself, we can all tell you what a, what a terrible experience it is. And, um, but I think all three of us had in common that we've come out stronger people, um, absolutely. And um, so I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Ma, turn it out to, to kind of talk to us about and you know, answer some of the questions. You know, what are some of the common symptoms and signs that, that a patient will experience when they come to you? You're muted. There you go. Still muted. In the left, on, on, in the left, no, geez, the right, on the right side of your screen, you, you should have it. Wait, can I unmute you? Carrie. Yeah, Chris, let's take it back. Um, let's go back and let's just move on and we'll, we'll see okay. if we can get that. Right. So, yeah. um, so, so Jen Pace, let's, you know, let's talk about, uh, since Natalie mentioned us, to connect the yeah. brain to and, and how, um, you know, the services that we can provide and, and really how we formed it and what we're here to do for patients like Natalie and anybody sure. else themselves in this position. Sure, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, great, thank you so much. Uh, obviously, you mentioned that I was diagnosed with brain tumor, and at the time, uh, similar to Natalie's story and yours as well, I didn't know where to turn, and I really didn't know anyone else who had been diagnosed with brain tumor. So the Connecticut Brain Tumor Alliance has been formed as a place for people to turn and be able to reach out and communicate with other patients that have been gone through diagnosis. And no two diagnoses are the same, as Dr. Malaterno will um, attest to that, but it's just so comforting to be able to speak to someone else who has been through a similar situation and be able to ask questions. And I really, in the beginning, unlike what Natalie said, how she was not afraid of having to have a brain surgery, my first concern was, oh my gosh, I've never had surgery in my life. And now you're telling me I have to have brain surgery. And to me, that was terrifying. So being able to speak to another person who had been through brain surgery, came through it. And, uh, you know, it was an important thing for me to be able to do. And so we provide things like that for people uh, who want to speak to someone. Oftentimes, though, we don't meet someone until after they've been diagnosed, gone through surgery, and now are in a treatment phase. And, uh, in addition to just being a voice or an ear to listen to, we also offer programs of support through for brain tumor support, as well as uh, a group called Good Grief Group for people who have lost loved ones and want to come together with others to have that sense of support. Great, thank you. So, Dr. Mothran, are you uh, are you about to? Is your unmuted now? You're still.
Try again. All right. No. Hmm. Carrie, any thoughts? Yeah. Try maybe try popping off and just coming back into the to the webinar. It might be your settings look good. It might just be a glitchy thing. Um, so, so Natalie, you know, I, a question for you, um, you know, as you were going through all this, um, you know, you, you talked a lot about not, you know, um, not looking at it as a challenge, but more as a, um, you know, a, I don't want to call it a happy obstacle, but something that, that, you know, you, you had such a, a way of facing this, um, and, you know, I'm wondering if you can, if you would share more about, you know, why you were, how you were able to, you know, take something so bad, but make it such a positive and, and really turn a negative into such a good thing that has happened to you and how you're helping others and, and giving back and really embracing the cause and trying to make this world a better place for everybody with a brain tumor. Well, I think um, it's... I, uh, to be honest, I think I've always been sort of a positive person in life. Um, and I think resilience is, it's a little bit like a muscle memory thing. Um, and I, I've had, I've had a great life, but also I've also had a difficult life um, in a way, like in my past, I've had, you know, I've had like the loss of my first fiance, for example. And then I had um, some really big family issues, unfortunately. Um, and those big traumas, I think, have had already made me a strong person. So when I found by the time I'm, you know, experiencing this part of my life, um, which is obviously the most difficult one I've ever had, um, I think I was already a little bit of a resilient person. So I think that helped me in a way. Um, but in another way, and this also, I think it's, it comes from my family. We are a very positive family. And there's two ways of living an experience like this, or, you know, or you're absolutely traumatized by this experience and you carry on your life, you know, stuck in the past and traumatized, or you accept, embrace, smile at it and, 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 and enjoy a new life and call it resilience, call it stubbornness, um, you know, whatever word you want to use. But I think, I think, in that we, we, we all get one life and we have just one chance to make it worth it and worth it for yourself is, you know, by being happy and it's worth it for others by helping others. And, and honestly, I also think that this is not in this question, but I, I also, one thing I learned is that when people go through difficult things in life, they become better person or better people. Um, and if the whole world, not like I want anybody to go through this experience, but I think maybe with COVID-19, I'm really hoping that as a, as humankind, or, you know, society, we're going through such a difficult thing. I really hope we all learn about such a difficult period and become better people. Because I think when we, we pass difficult things, we become better. Um, Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. So, so thank you, Doctor. And um, so, just to repeat my question for you: is so it, you know, if you can just share with with the audience, what are some of the common signs and symptoms that of a brain tumor that will lead someone to to consult with you in your practice? Sure. sure. So sorry about all of that. My computer is probably sick of Zoom and telehealth and everything else, given the pandemic. <laughs> Um, so uh, patients will often um, present similar to Natalie with a trauma or something that's completely unrelated and have an incidental finding of a brain tumor. Other patients can present with headaches that are just different than their usual headaches. Um, people can present with seizures, of course. Um, and then of course, patients can present with focal, what we call focal neurological deficits. Um, issues with language or vision or speech or strength, um, that sort of thing. So they can really present with a, a wide variety of, of symptoms and presentations. Yeah. And, and so you know, we, we know that there's benign tumors and malignant tumors. And, and within the, the, those two classes, I mean, 
I, I couldn't even guess how many different types of tumors there are, but um, no two tumors are identical, correct? I mean, they're- Correct. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think we have always said this before, and I truly believe it, that um, Natalie's tumor, for instance, the vast majority of meningiomas are benign um, histologically. Um, but I would say that uh, I don't think anybody would con be convinced that she had a benign tumor because of what she went through with it mm -hmm. um, and, and the effects of it. So I really personally don't believe there's anything um, such as a benign brain tumor for that reason, because of the effects that it has on the person, on the person's brain, on their life, on their family, et cetera. Um, but of course, you know, there are tumors that are more aggressive than others and the risk of coming back is much greater. Um, and that's what makes tumors, you know, more malignant, uh, more challenging to deal with for sure. Right. So after, after someone presents with you and a diagnosis is made, um, what, is the, what is the standard of care and what is the normal or the standard course of procedure once upon diagnosis? It really varies. So, um, you know, I, I, it depends on, on a host of, of things. So one is what kind of tumor we think we're dealing with. So is it something that is more benign and slow growing? Um, or is it something that's more malignant and aggressive? Um, so that factors in. Um, the patient's age, of course, factors in. Uh, the patient's health factors in. Are they um, a good surgical candidate or not? Is this something we can treat surgically? Is this something that um, is better uh, treated with chemotherapy or radiation, which I would say that, you know, that's, that's pretty less common. Um, usually um, um, surgery, and, and by surgery, I mean removing as much of the tumor as possible is, is important as part of the treatment, usually. Yeah, and at, at Yale, which is you know, you know, one of the best brain tumor centers here in, in New England, if not the U.S., um, what are some of the tools and, and capabilities that you can offer to a patient and their family to cope with this diagnosis? Sure. So, um, so one is, you know, we at Yale, as you mentioned, our brain tumor center, we offer very specialized um, care. So I only perform brain tumor surgery. Um, that is my specialty, that is my expertise. And there's other brain tumor surgeons such as myself that again, all we do is brain tumor surgery. And so there's something to be said for, for really uh, honing your skills and honing your expertise and, and doing the same type of work day in and day out. Um, so that's number one. Number two, we work in a multidisciplinary team. Um, and so, of course, understanding from my perspective that neurosurgery is not the only way to treat tumors, um, um, not all tumors. Some, some tumors, like some types of meningiomas, can be treated just with surgery alone, as well as some other tumors. But um, a lot of other tumors require um, more than just surgery, chemotherapy and radiation. And so we use a multidisciplinary approach to to um, determine the best way to, to manage um, tumors together as a group. Um, and I actually run our brain tumor board uh, and our precision brain tumor board <clears throat> and where we actually look at the genetics underlying the tumors and that helps guide our treatments. And then I'd say another um, uh, big resource that we have are the facilities. And so um, we have state-of-the-art operating rooms in particular where uh, we have an interoperative three Tesla MRI, which allows us or allows me to see how much tumor I have removed and gives me the opportunity to go back and remove more if I think it's safe to during the surgery. So it allows us to, to push the extent of resection, which has been shown with, with most tumors to correlate uh, with outcome. Mm -hmm. Um, and so once, you know, after, after diagnosis, after treatment and surgery, uh, the big thing, and I know for myself and, and Jen Pace and Natalie, it was that support system. So I know mm -hmm. Yale has, you know, support groups. Um, Jen Pace, do you want to talk about, you know, I know you mentioned it briefly, but uh, how could a patient reach out to us for that, for that support? And, and how do they, you know, how do they come attend our, our Grey Room and Club meetings? And, and kind of, if you could just both of you share a little bit about the support that you know, is available to a patient and their family after this diagnosis? 
Sure. Well, the first, um, Dr. Malaterno can speak to Yale support group. I know they have a support group within their hospital, as does uh, other hospitals around the state have their own support groups. Ours is not affiliated with any one hospital. We represent, you know, and in, in, uh, support anybody in Connecticut and anyone really from anywhere who reaches out and is looking for help with brain tumors. So in our case, the best way to reach us is usually by going through our website, which is ctbta.org. And uh, you can easily email us, make an inquiry, and one of us will get back to you pretty quickly. So that's the easiest way to reach out to the Connecticut Brain Tumor Alliance. As far as Yale's, um, I'll, let, I'll let Dr. Malaterno speak to the best way to get, find out about their support group. So ours is actually open to everybody as well, um, similarly, not just to uh, Yale patients. We're always more than happy to, to help support any patients. And so um, we have a monthly support meeting, which is for all types of brain tumors. Um, and then in addition, we have some uh, other brain tumor support. Uh, one, for instance, is for acoustic neuromas that occurs quarterly. So every few months um, that group meets. Uh, and again, it's open to everybody and, um, and anybody can just email me is, is the easiest way. Um, and, and I can give you that information. Um, it's of course on our Smilo website and, and several of our websites, but that, that's an easy way to do that. And I can provide my email at the end. Um, I think that, you know, listening to Natalie's story and her, um, her discussion with the surgeon and, and her husband's discussion. And I think expectations are so important. Um, and, and really understanding what you're getting into is, is so important. Um, and I tend to, to be a little bit um, very much towards the opposite, where I try to prepare people for every possible thing that can go wrong. Um, just because that's, that's more of, of the, the kind of person that I am, because I try to think about everything in advance as much as possible. But sometimes you still can't even think of things. Um, they, they can just happen. Um, another thing that, that also struck me too is I, I rarely ever um, give numbers. Um, and so the reason why is because um, it's really hard to predict numbers. And that's, that's in terms of risk that's also in terms of prognosis. Um, there's always, um, especially with prognosis, there's always a bell curve um, with the more malignant tumors. But even with risk uh, and that sort of thing, um, you know, who cares if the risk is 2% or 8% if you're part of the percent, you know, that ends up getting uh, the complication or the issue. So I always, in my mind, just try to focus on this is a part of the risk um, and, you know, we'll, we'll help support you however we can if that, if that ends up being an issue. A lot of times, too, that I think patients don't understand or appreciate is sometimes with these tumors, um, uh, it's amazing how the brain can compensate so much. Um, and then when, when we remove the tumor, only then do you really see how debilitated the person was being made by the tumor. And so that can be really hard for patients um, and their families as well. So again, so going back to support, um, we provide, um, of course, all of the physical therapy and occupational therapy and cognitive therapy and vestibular rehab or whatever uh, specialized rehab is needed, um, we provide for. And then of course, with the, the generosity of Connecticut Brain Tumor Alliance, as well as others, we're able to provide funds to patients too, um, so that they can help get themselves back on the road to recovery. Great. <clears throat> um, and, and so, uh, you know, one last question for each of the, the panelists. So, you know, if you can provide one or two biggest takeaways of your journey and, and you know, a, a message uh, going forward that, you know, I know Natalie's already, um, so Jen, pay some, you know, for you to share yours. Um, you know, what, what are what, what are one or two things that you know how, how your life has changed and your perspective and outlook on life? Well, really, it's not so different from what Natalie said, and I, I think it's all about how you approach things in having that positive focus. That rather than thinking about what you've lost, focusing on what you've maybe realized you've gained in the process or just 
focus on what you can do as opposed to what you can't do and not let this define you. I mean, I think it was very important to me after I was diagnosed not to just be di not to be seen as a brain tumor patient because we're all so much more than that. Yes, we have been diagnosed with brain tumor and it's one part of our life, but we're still daughters and sisters and mothers and wives and friends and, and community members. And there's so many more things that define people. So to just like pinhole yourself as, oh, I'm a brain tumor patient and let that become what rules the rest of your life. For me, you know, that's my biggest takeaway. It's much more than that. And I think that's really one of the sort of um, foundations of Connecticut Brain Tumor Alliance. We wanted people to see that, okay, so you've been diagnosed with brain tumor, but you can still have a life and a full life and really live and, and model that for people. And I think that's one of the things that we truly try to support as an organization and which is why we want to be supportive to people individually and collectively and just helping them understand that, you know, we can all go on. And as we have always said, stronger together, we can do this together. And it takes, it's, it's a, you know, it, I think the hard thing with brain tumor diagnosis to um, not to digress, but a brain tumor can affect you as a person in, you know, like your person, your brain is your personality. It's who you are and it, as is your heart and other parts of your body. But it, it's so different than other times when people have injury. Um, I think, you know, people really see with a brain tumor, sometimes you hope for the best, but sometimes in Natalie's case, you go through surgery and suddenly you're not the same person that went into surgery. And that's shocking, not only individually, but to the entire family, as Natalie pointed out. And as many times as I've heard her story, I still remark every single time at how I'm like in awe of her because I can't get over the strength and resilience that she represents and displays because it's amazing that people do go through these things and they come out on the other side and they, they lose so much, but then they also gain back even more. And they, they, you know, it's the, the recovery is just like awe inspiring to me. I, I'm, I'm humbled. And Natalie, same question for you. I mean, I, I know you shared, I, you touched on upon it already, um, but you know, if, if you want to hammer that that message home and just um, letting everybody know to to not lose hope and not lose that faith, and, and that you know, with every obstacle, uh, there there's new there's new adventures, there's there's new opportunities that lie ahead. Um, and you know, looking at this diagnosis, it's, it's um, for a lot of people, it could be you know demoralizing. Um, but for all of us here, um, we, we turned something really bad and made it into a positive. Um, and, and Natalie, I commend you for everything in your book. It's, it's wonderful. And, and your story is remarkable. Uh, and, and I hope everybody has the opportunity to read, read the story if they haven't already. Thank you. Carrie, are there any questions that we have missed that have come in from the audience? Um, so there was a question for Natalie. Um, Natalie, uh, attendee is wondering um, how, what's your experience of talking to other people with brain tumors? How does that feel? And um, do you think your personality has changed from the person that you were? I mean, obviously parts of you have changed since, but your sort of person, your, your kind of innate personality has changed from um, prior to the surgery to, to now from this experience? What was the first part of the question? Um, <laughs> just curious about what it's like to talk to other people, just to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with other people about brain tumors, how that feels and, you know, having gone through the experience yourself. Well, to be honest, it depends. If I don't know that many brain tumor survivors, actually. I mean, I think just in this panel, I, I have a lot more brain tumor survivors that I actually know in my individual life. Um, I don't know why I haven't really met that many. Um, I don't know, like in Westbrook, I, I, I don't know why. Um, I did, the people that I've met are literally just like online, not um, in real life. So, um, so I don't really know how to answer that part because I, I mean, I've never really been able to speak with another brain tumor survivor about this. Actually, it's a very good question. Like, I think I, Chris, we need to speak about our experience and Jen, please, because I've never been able to actually speak with anyone about this, like on the same, you know, survivor to survivor. I, I'm always survivor to, to not 
you know, normal humans. So, um, <laughs> so to answer the question in terms of survivor to normal human, um, it's actually, it's, it's, it's surprising. I think, I don't know why people admire brain tumor survivors. I don't, I don't understand why, because it's, it's not something we earned or worked for or deserved or it's beautiful. Um, but I don't know why, why would people admire me? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I think, I think I, at least I think my family admire that I've become a better person. Um, but in general, I, 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 I don't know why. I, I don't know why. I, 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 I think it's just like a human trait to admire people that have gone through the difficult thing in life and, and um, have been able to, you know, um, continue. But I think as well that the, if we're able to stand up, there's, we have to be able to stand up being a better person. Um, that's the whole reason for, and I think, and I forgot what I was saying before. Short term memory. See, I tell you, I, this is where you can really start to see a brain tumor survivor. When you dig too much in, then you see that the, the <laughs> brain is not there. <laughs> um, I forgot the second question. So, so I also just, just, do you feel like you're the same person prior to the? Ah, yes, that was the question. No, definitely no. Um, definitely not. I, it's, and it's, that's actually interesting because there's a lot of, I think a lot of the sadness is nostalgia towards the person you used to be, the things that you could do before that you can no longer do, or just me, for example, trying to write this presentation before I could do it in a second. It's so difficult for me now. It takes so long. It takes so long to understand things. It, it takes, my God, I don't have the patience. And it's so, it, it is, I am a completely different person. I mean, I, I, I think I've gained a lot of um, humanity. I've become a better person in that sense. Um, at the same time, I've gained things that are not good. You know, I've gained, I'm more impatient. My husband says I'm in a, I'm in a pissy mood all the time. Um, but that's my husband saying that. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's I I I I think our personality. I think any big challenge in life, it doesn't have to be a brain tumor, changes people, makes us um, progress, um, and makes us learn if we use it in that way. So I think any challenge really changes our personalities mm -hmm. in general. Actually, absolutely. Um, so there's another question that came in. Uh, someone is wondering if there are any organizations addressing the emotional needs of kids of parents that have been diagnosed specifically? That's, that is a great question. And we have talked about it before. Uh, in fact, there's a young girl who we are, are, is connected with the Connecticut Brain Tumor Alliance. And at one point she was making care packages for kids whose parents had been diagnosed and, and willing to you know, communicate with them that way. I think in what we typically would do is try to find someone else, another child maybe who would be willing to reach out to them and talk to them if it's something they've wanted. We've offered and asked you know, if that's a, something a family would want and embrace. And if it is, we do our best to try to put some people, you know, make the connections for them. I don't know of a specific organization that's geared toward that, but we would do our best to, you know, put, give children the opportunity to speak to other children that have been through a diagnosis with their parent. And so that would just be contacting you through the Connecticut mm -hmm. Brain Alliance. Yeah, reach, the, reach out to myself or Chris through the Connecticut Brain Tumor Alliance. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, there's a question around managing anxiety, uh, how, how anxiety is managed through the process of, you know, the journey of all of this. Um, any specific things that worked or helped or? I think it's, uh, for personally, it's an individual situation, you know, situational based on the individual. And most people I've encountered or met will work with their physicians if it means 
certainly something like uh, therapy, you know, seeking a therapist and having talk therapy and that kind of thing for anxiety. And often most, and Dr. Moliterno is probably better to speak to this than I am, but I think most physicians are willing to work with patients if they are in need of medicines for anxiety and that kind of thing. It's really dependent upon um, if it's something that's presented because of the tumor or the surgery or you know the whole experience and, and each patient's different so it's really individual but i think you work with your physician and um figure out what's probably the best course of action for the individual great yeah i would agree i think that um i think that uh, understanding that it's normal to have anxiety about this and it's normal to be upset about this and it's normal to have all those feelings is really helpful. I always say I'm just a brain surgeon. I'm not a psychiatrist or I'm not a psychologist. And I actually don't prescribe those medications um, because I'm not the most appropriate person to do that. But I know our neuro-oncology doctors do and, and certainly primary care doctors do. And we always get social workers involved and um, I think that the more support that you have, and again, I, I think what Jen said is completely true. It's, it's every person is, is different. The one thing I would say is that um, going back to the positive attitude, I do notice when patients um, are more positive about um, their situation or their approach, they, they really do seem to do better overall. It's pretty remarkable. So, yep. Really interesting. That is true. And so just one thing, one other thought, you know, on the emotional and anxiety aspect, um, you know, that's, I would encourage anybody experiencing it as a result of a brain tumor or if it's seizures um, to, con you know, con get in touch with us because, and that's, that's what we're here for. We, uh, we're, we're all survivors and caregivers and um, patients ourselves. And to be able to talk with others who understand where you're coming from and that could, you know, appreciate your, your, the struggles you're going through, at least for, for myself, and I think Jen pays to you as well, um, it, it made all the difference in the world, and, and it really kind of changed the course of my life and my career, um, and what's what, what led me here. So, um, you know, I encourage anybody to get in touch with us, ctbta.org, and, um, you know, we, we'll, we'll find the appropriate place to, you know, con connect with you on that. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, there was a question directed Chris to Chris and Jen, um, wondering if you both had any side effects similar to Natalie's after your surgery, and if and if you're still managing or dealing with anything now. I, I'm going to let Chris answer that because he 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 too was a hero of mine, uh, just like mm -hmm. Natalie. I mean, he would, went through so much more. I was very lucky in that I did not have uh, side effects that debilitated me in the way that Natalie shared and, and Chris can share too, that both of them went through huge trials. Um, so I, I did not, I, I would say that, you know, there are certain side effects that we all sort of go through when you talk about things like anxiety or, um, you know, depression and feeling certain going through treatments and having to deal with the side effects of treatments. I did, I did end up going through radiation and chemotherapy after my surgery. Um, for quite a while, and that came with some side effects. But people, are, <laughs> physicians would always say, "Well, as long as they're tolerable." And I guess tolerable is, is uh, one nice way of putting it. But it's, that's relative to the person as well. But I, it was tolerable for me. I managed to continue with my, at the time, part-time job and still do my work and raise my children and go through my therapy. Um, but you know. There's things like headaches that are pretty typical. Um, you know, Natalie talks about the short-term memory. I, to this day, will sometimes wonder, is the short-term memory related to having had brain surgery and a brain tumor, or is that just part of normal life and aging and something most of us do go through? So it's hard to sometimes pinpoint. I think it's easy when you've been through something so dramatic to think, oh, and put blame on it, but I can't say with utmost sincerity that I would say my tumor caused that. It's very hard to know. Just in the same way, I'll spend my entire life and someday pass on and not really ever know what caused my brain tumor. It's just something that happened in my life. Mm -hmm. Chris? Um, and, and so for me, I mean, my, my story is actually very similar to, that, to Natalie's. Um, I was diagnosed with a benign tumor uh, that also sat within the ventricles. 
um, most amazing surgeon and I'm blessed to have found him. Um, but you know, there were complications with my, with my tumor. It was a, you know, later determined to be atypical of nature. Um, I've gone through five surgeries, three for the tumor, two for a shunt. Um, Dr. Moss Turner could, you know, quickly explain what a shunt is, but I had hydrocephalus with his, um, water on the brain. Um, so, uh, after everything, uh, you know, I was in law school at the time I'm, time of my diagnosis, I came out of surgery reading Dr. Seuss and, you know, relearning the alphabet. Um, and I, it took me a very, very long time to, to be able to, to get back to who I am today. Um, I went back to law school. I graduated. Uh, I sat for the bar three times. Um, so, you know, it, it, took me, it took me a long, long time to, to get where I am. But after everything, I would sit in the law firm and I would, you know, do everything. And I, I would say, this is just not for me. My heart is not in this. I have a passion for helping others and giving back and wanting to do good. And, and you know, I, I'm not a doctor, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but what I can do is I can help and I can inspire and I can work alongside these amazing people that are treating and saving lives. So uh, along with Jen, uh, you know, I, I, I joined the board of directors, I got involved as a volunteer um, and, uh, you know, I wasn't even looking for the opportunity, but uh, the position of executive director found me and uh, I'm coming up on two years in July. And, uh, you know, I have no, that this is, this is who I am now and what I want to do. And um, I am just so inspired by, by everybody else's stories and uh, what I see on a day-to-day -day basis to everybody working together to collaborate, collaboratively make this disease go away, or if not advance the treatment so that we could, um, you know, be on a, Find a, find a place where we're one day able to, to treat it like lung cancer and breast cancer um, and add other types of illnesses that, um, that we, we strive for. So, um, you know, I, I have a blog, it's graymattersblog.com if you're interested in learning more about my journey. Um, it is, it, as I mentioned, it's very similar to, to Natalie's story, um, but maybe I will someday write a book about it, who knows? Um, All right, I was <laughs> here. I'm back. Um, so let's do um, one last question, and then we'll we'll finish up. Um, a question around how each of you might prep someone in terms of your advice or just something to look out for, or just sort of the words of wisdom um, prior to a brain tumor related surgery. What would you What would your advice be? So I would say, you know, for for me, I would just um, keep the faith, um, you know, you, 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 you're in great hands with, with your surgeon and the medical team there. Stay optimistic, stay positive. Um, you know, going in for, for, for brain surgery, it, it's scary, it's an unknown. Um, but, you know, tr trust the doctors, trust that they, you know, they're, they're experts in this. They do this every day, all day. Um, and, you know, they, they will take great care of you. Yeah, I was second with Chris has said, I literally was lying in the OR on the operating table shaking and my surgeon looked at me and said, why are you shaking? And I said, I'm scared. And he was like, what are you, you know, what are you afraid of? I mean, to him doing surgery is like probably changing a tire for a car mechanic. They do it day in and day out. But I was, like, but to me as a patient, I'm thinking, are you kidding me? You're going to cut into my skull and, and cut into my brain. And I was terrified, but I will say if I, if my, if I could go back and tell my old self what I know now, it would be try to stay calm as best you can, try to calm yourself and find ways of just thinking peaceful thoughts and know that you're, you know, as long as you've done your, you've done your due diligence, you're going with someone that you feel comfortable with and hopefully you are, which I recommend. I'm definitely an advocate for you know, getting a second opinion and making sure you're comfortable with who's doing your surgery. But once you've, you know, trusted this person, I think you have to have faith and trust and do whatever you can do to just stay calm and um, go through the process. And there's a lot of faith involved and you pray to God. And before you know it, you're waking up and someone's asking you questions <laughs> and you may or may not be able to answer. <laughs> um. I would say, I'm going to be a bit more realistic. I would say before surgery, in my experience, I wish I would have done so much more before. Um, for example, um, and, and in my book, I actually wrote this advice, like before a surgery, give every single 
like password, email, bank account number to a loved one. I came out of my surgery. <coughs> I didn't, I did, I could not, I couldn't read or write, obviously, but I could not remember any email password. I could not remember any bank account password. My husband had to do a, a detective job to be able to find all these things out um, because we weren't prepared for me not remembering anything of my life after that. Um, you know, I was the one that managed the, the bills in the house, the water, the electricity, like everything. We were about to get our services shut because we didn't have, he didn't have any of that information, for example. Um, another thing I would recommend, check your disability. If you're working and, you're, and you have, for example, disability benefits, long-term and short-term disability, check that. It's really important if you have it. Um, and if not, get one. Get a life insurance. The younger you get it, the better it is. I think we all wait too long. I think, I think we are all way too positive in life, which is great, but I think we need to plan for the worst and expect the best throughout our lives. But, you know, if only I would have known this before, if only I would have gotten a health insurance before my surgery, I could have one. No one will give me a, health, a life insurance now. No one for example. Um, no one will, you know, I, I am disabled now officially. And um, it's, you know, all these things I wish I would have known before. Um, I would, it's, it's very difficult to be disabled um, so young. It's, it's, it's very, it gives me a lot of anxiety. It's, it's scary. It's really scary um, when you have so much life ahead of you. So my advice would be not with the, just, in not only for before a brain tumor, but in general, you know, um, get your, you know, prepare for the worst because it could, anything could come. Any other cancer could come, you know, anyways, a car could hit you. Um, COVID-19 could get you now. Um, so, you know, prepare for the worst. That way you can live a, a, a happy life knowing you have everything in place. I would, to answer that question from the other side, um, I think the most important thing that you can do is make sure whose hands you're in. Um, and so I think brain surgery, um, I always say, I'm always amazed how patients will sign up for surgery um, and, and just take my word for it and trust me and just sign up and, and go with it. Um, because to me, it must be the scariest um, thing to be told uh, by anyone. And so I couldn't even imagine. Um, and especially even now during the pandemic, it's, it's, there's even more uh, things to consider. So I can't even imagine how scary it is. But I think the number one thing um, is to find out whose hands you're in um, and, and make sure that they're the best hands possible. And I think the best way to do that is um, a lot of times that means being at an academic institution. That's where um, neurosurgeons are, are able to specialize and they're able to focus, whether it's brain tumors or stroke surgeons or um, Parkinson's surgeons or whatever, but they're, they're really subspecialized in academic institutions. So I think um, having, um, there's, been, there's been lots of studies that show that the outcomes are better uh, with surgeons when they're more subspecialized. And so I think that makes a big difference. And so, um, you know, word of mouth is, is one, of course, but asking the surgeon, um, how many of these do you do a year? How many of these do you do a week? How many of these do you do a day? Um, I think you get very, very different answers if you get honest answers. And um, as Jen said, I think second opinions are important, but they can, um, they can also be confusing, um, especially if, if certain surgeons present something one way uh, versus another. So I think in the end, um, I think being somewhere, uh, like I said, that has more subspecialized ways of, of managing brain tumors in surgery and beyond surgery is probably the best and safest bet. But in reality, I think it's very hard for people to do that. I always say that all the time. You don't need, you know, you, you don't know that you need a brain tumor surgeon until you have a brain tumor. And then suddenly, you know, I see it all the time on the opposite side where 
you know, patients are, are kind of forced into surgery, you need surgery the next day. And really they don't, you know, they can wait a, a little bit or something like that, but there's lots of, of, of things that go on, um, uh, unfortunately. Um, so I think that it's very hard to kind of weed through that, but I do think that um, organizations like Connecticut Brain Tumor Alliance, for instance, is a great resource. Um, and, and I think they can be very useful or, or reaching out to other brain tumor patients, either through support groups, et cetera, to try to get information. But sometimes it's just hard if it's, if it's such an acute thing, so. But it's true. I wish I would have known Connecticut Brain Tumor Alliance existed when this happened to me, you know? I, there wasn't anything when this happened to me. It is a, it is a great um, resource for patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, on, the, on that note, um, I will say that if anyone, if anyone has any further questions, if there's any questions that haven't been answered for anyone, you can contact Chris or Jen, who are right here and here on my screen, <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the um, Connecticut Brain Tumor Alliance, and the website is ctbta.org. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I just want to thank you all for, for being here tonight and sharing your stories and um, just kind of opening this conversation up. Um, thank you, Chris and Jen and Natalie and Dr. Moliterno. I really appreciate you taking the time um, to, to just kind of engage in this conversation and share your, your powerful stories and all this information, which is so um, helpful to, you know, to so many people out there. So please um, contact uh, the Connecticut Brain Tumor Alliance if there's any more questions. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for being here tonight. Um, I hope you all stay really, really well and um, hope to see you all soon. Thanks, Thanks so thank much. You. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you Bye so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.